Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Commodity TV, and it's time for a new edition of our interview presentation. And we have for the first time here Kucho Copper at Commodity TV. As you know, copper is hot, e-mobility is moving, and we need a lot of copper and even more copper in this world. And so we, yeah, we know this fantastic company already for a longer time. And Vince Sorace, whom you are seeing here already, the CEO of Kucho Copper, is now with us. Welcome and good morning. Morning to Canada. How are you, Vince? Good morning, Jochen. How are you? And thank you very much for having me on your show today. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time. And as I said, we will do this in an interview presentation style. Our viewers know that already because we think it's really important to get your fantastic story to our viewers. And copper is hot. And I would say after viewing your presentation before and making up my mind, I would say Kucho Copper is hot. And this is why I say, Vince, please get started. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so Kucho Copper is, is uh, let's start by saying, you know, it's an advanced stage asset. Um, this, this, um, we, this asset already has a pre-feasibility study done on it. It was done uh, in, in around 2010. Um, so, you know, this is an asset that, um, you know, we're, it's an advanced stage that we're looking to complete our feasibility study here in the next about six weeks. And then really uh, our strategy is through permitting and into production. So that's just be a little flavor about, um, you know, kind of what level this asset is about. Um, and, you know, we, this was something that we acquired from Capstone, uh, Capstone Mining back in 2017. We identified it as an opportunity. Um, Capstone was not advancing the asset. They were uh, busy working with Santa Domingo and Pinto Valley. And so we purchased this from them uh, for about $28 million Canadian um, back in the end of 2017. We closed that transaction because we saw a lot of opportunity. This was a high grade asset um, and you know, grade is very, very important uh, as I think everybody knows. Uh, we saw the ability to kind of improve uh, the asset from an economic perspective. Uh, we saw the ability to grow the size of the asset. So we saw scalability. And that's, um, you know, why why we went out and bought this. And we've been working on it for the last couple of years and moving it forward. Um, we brought in some, sorry. Yeah, which short question, because I see already wheat and precious metals and they came in like 2017, 2018. That is quite early. So they saw the opportunity too. Yeah, we, we, we brought them in as a, as a, as a partner uh, to help uh, on a number of fronts with this. Um, you know, I, I've um, known the guys at Wheaton. They're a fantastic organization. They have an exceptionally strong technical team, very good reputation. And so when, when I looked at this together with them, you know, they helped us on the acquisition side. Um, they brought $20 million to the table to help with part of that purchase price, which is something they've never done before. They did that with via some debt uh, with us. Uh, they've never done that before. And then they actually participated in the equity financing we did too, to the tune of $4 million. And they, they also uh, advanced us uh, about 7 million US to help money in the ground in 2018 as we were gathering all the data uh, and doing some resource expansion drilling and all the stuff needed to go into the feasibility study. So they, they, um, they took a lot of risk with us. They liked the asset. And then we eventually did a streaming arrangement with them. And we'll talk more about that uh, in the next um, two pages of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, just, you know, touch briefly on the team. You know, this team was put together specifically when we did this acquisition uh, to move Cucho through feasibility and permitting. OK, so, you know, this is where the experience is. We've had a lot of guys on the team uh, that are very strong on the permitting front, very strong on the technical front, very familiar with VMS type deposits, copper, um, copper VMS type deposits and lots of experience um, with uh, you know, engineering and feasibility studies. You know, as you can see, uh, no, you know, not too many guys uh, that uh, you know, have built and operated mines, but that's a very different uh, group of people. Um, they don't, you know, this group of people needs to get it from point A to point B. And then depending on what happens with the company, uh, you know, if we sell the company or there's an exit from that perspective, or we bring in the engineers and the mine builders, you know, after that, but that's a, that's mm -hmm. a, a transition that we will look forward to in the future. But right now the team is excellent at getting, uh, getting it through the next phase of its life cycle and the board, you'll notice that Stephen Quinn, uh, Stephen Quinn used to be the CEO of, um, um, Minus gold. gold. He was also the CEO of Sherwood Copper. So mm -hmm. Stephen Quinn used to 
own this asset. He liked this asset. Um, back when he ran Sherwood Copper, you know, Cucho was something that he was going to put into production next. He just finished putting Minto into production. So, you know, he came back into this because he always believed in the asset. Um, you know, and just another notable Bill Bennett used to be the BC Mines Minister. Uh, so, you know, very familiar with, um, you know, helping us, guiding us through uh, British Columbia where the asset resides. Mm -hmm. um, and, I must, and, and I must say, really, Stephen Quinn, I know him 10 years, also through Midas Gold. I interviewed him several times. What a fantastic guy to have him on board, I must say. Fantastic individual, uh, yeah. helps us a lot. Um, he's been, uh, he was a fantastic addition to the, to the board mm -hmm. of directors. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit about our, our, our capital structure. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also very, I'm always very careful in, in capital structures. I like keeping them as tight as I can. So, you know, we went through a couple of tough years, uh, 2018 and 19 in the copper markets. And so, you know, I didn't want to, I, I did worry about dilution and I didn't want to, you know, so we, you know, we, we, we managed our time and our capital properly. Um, and so we've, I think we've got a pretty tight cap table still less than a hundred million shares. Um, and we're in a, we're in a very good position with, uh, with the project and we've got some exceptional shareholders. Um, you know, Capstone, uh, you see is, um, still 10% shareholder in us. Um, Wheaton is a seven and a half percent equity shareholder in us. Um, so, uh, a, a very good shareholder base and a good cap table, I believe. Would Capstone be somebody who might bring this then with you together in production or might be uh, the exit guy? You never know. I mean, life has changed dramatically for them. And life, yeah. life means, you know, if, it, if this was if this was a couple of years ago, maybe not because they sold us the asset. But I mean, look what's happened to the likes of Capstone and the Copper Mountains and, and these yeah. guys. I mean, They've had significant uh, success and share price appreciation and, and with their business because of, you know, commodity prices. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe um, that's something that, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll move on a bit here too. So a little bit about the Wheaton, um, you know, everything I talked about with their financing package worked out to be about over $100 million, the commitment level. Um, so with everything they provided us to help us buy the asset, and then we did this streaming arrangement with them where, <clears throat> where they paid us, um, um, it was a total of 65 million. They valued just the precious metal component. So we did a stream on just silver and gold. And that's important because you can see in the, uh, metal, uh, percent contribution to revenue that that's only 8% of the revenue of the project. So we did not encumber the primary commodities, copper and some zinc. Um, so when we did this transaction with them, really it was nav neutral on the company. Um, and so we thought it was a very good deal. Um, it gives us, um, basically now about 58 million us dollars, um, that it would come in towards development capital, uh, when we begin to build the project. Uh, so it reduces the capital requirements that we, uh, we need when we build the project and need to raise money for building the project. Um, we also, how much, how much money do you have to raise for the whole project? Well, that's going to be coming out in the feasibility study. Okay. You know, in the pre-feasibility study, you know, the capital was less than 300 million. Um, but you'll see in the recent press release we just put out, that was a very big update um, a couple of days ago and a very important update from a number of different perspectives. Um, you know, we've increased um, the throughput now to 4,500 tons per day. So bigger facility, bigger plant. So capital will be higher than it is in the pre-fees, but you know, this is still going to be a sub $500 million capital project. So in the sweet spot, very financeable. Uh, it's not a billion or $2 billion asset. You know, this is what the market likes and financiers like these days. It's, you know, low capital, um, you know, high margin type assets, uh, which are, um, you know, easy to finance, easier to finance these days, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then last, you know, on this, there's, there's, um, you know, we did the streaming arrangement with Wheaton, but we get to capture some of the upsides. So once we deliver the first 5.6 million ounces of silver and 50,000 ounces of gold, that reverts to 66%. So we get to capture some of the upside of the remaining, you know, gold and silver. And then, you know, there's also a nice little bonus payment we negotiated. If we get um, our throughput to 4,500 tons per day, there's a $20 million U.S. bonus payment for us in there as well. So, you know, a good deal, I think, for both both sides on this one. Yeah, and I think also with those higher copper and zinc prices, uh, that uh, yeah will look much much better now in the feasibility study, right? Than the to, than the twenty seventeen pre feasibility. Well, I the could pre -feasibility, imagine. 
used uh, 275 copper in it as well. So yeah, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is you know highly sensitive to copper prices. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, uh, with yeah. what's happened uh, with copper prices now, it, it has a very very positive impact on the on the on the project. Yes. Yeah. Super. Um, and just to touch a little bit on where we are. Uh, we're in British Columbia, so in Canada, very very safe. And uh, mining jurisdiction, obviously, being in Canada and within British Columbia, you know, important to note that we're in a very mine, mining friendly jurisdiction of British Columbia. So we're in a, we're in a part of uh, the province where, you know, you have Red Chris and Bruce Jack and Dolor Creek. And so um, mines in production, mines in development. Um, you know, this has got a, it's a very friendly part of British Columbia with the First Nations. They're very pro mining. Um, and, uh, you know, very receptive to, to, uh, projects like Cucho. So, you know, local skilled workforce is available. Um, you know, and that's very important to note, not all, you know, parts of British Columbia are like this, but this is a very, very good part where projects get built. Mm -hmm. Cucho itself, um, and where we are, um, you know, it's a very accessible project. Uh, we've got on-site infrastructure, including, um, um, you know, a field camp and an airstrip, uh, we've currently got uh, ground access. It's a hundred kilometer access road, which will be upgraded to a hall road um, in the uh, feasibility study. And then it's really, it's about a 400 uh, uh, kilometer drive down a, a, a highway to the Port of Stewart. Uh, the Port of Stewart is where the concentrates would be shipped from. So it's a very subtle terrain, no mountainous regions. We're in this valley uh, to mine off of. So very easy. And, and you know, I, you know, it's, it's uh, I think the most remote thing about this project is that you know we we are going to be running off lng and diesel there's no nearby power lines but really all the other infrastructure is there for us it's in place it's in a good location and easily accessible mm -hmm. i won't talk too much about this i'm going to set this up for later but you know just a note here uh, on the geology that you see the orange dot where the kucho deposit is but we sit in a, in a geological formation that repeats itself multiple times over the our property position and just remember that for a little bit later now what we've done is just recently um and this was a big update uh, on monday the press release we put out you know kucho for the last 20 years has been well sorry 15 years has been talked about underground mining so we have three primary deposits uh this is a vms as i said the main lens the sumac lens and the so lens the main being the biggest um, and SO being the highest grade, smallest but highest grade. And I'll talk about the resources in a bit. Um, it was always contemplated that this asset would be always underground. And in the PFS, everything was contemplated underground other than a very, very small starter pit. Um, and we were heading in that direction uh, with our feasibility study. But we made a big pivot as we were doing trade off studies. And I was looking at the economic implications of, you know, can we can we open pit main? Um, there was some reservations in the past about doing that um, and which continued to kind of move into the future. But those reservations now have been, I would say, alleviated uh, in this region. There are open pits that exist already. OK, so there's now, you know, from 20 years ago, there's proper engineered solutions. Um, there's a different mindset with uh, regulatory bodies and First Nations that if you do your open pit uh, well, um, then it's OK. You know, people were scared of it. So, you know, you can see in the last two press releases, and, and I also put out that we're engaging the nations in uh, in uh, negotiations now with economic participation agreements. So they're not afraid of this anymore. So we made a big shift in the feasibility study in about February, March. And that's what I talked about on Monday, that we are now moving down for the feasibility study in an open pit mining scenario with Maine, um, which, as you know, when you open pit, mining costs are significantly cheaper. And that goes straight to the economics of the project. Yeah. So that would that would that mean that you could use, let's say, the open pit and the cash flow to take the money and do the underground development? The underground development, you know, ESO, and we'll you'll see more about this, but you know, we're 
start, we're going to start development pretty, pretty quickly and at the same time as well, because ESO has got extremely high grade. We want to get ESO online as soon as possible. I mean, Maine's got fantastic grade, don't get me wrong, but it actually done our trade-off studies and it makes sense for us to get that development capital going immediately to get ESO online into the mill as quickly as possible and even blend it with uh, the ore from Maine. And we've done a lot of look at that and, you know, when we should spend that capital and it makes sense to do it right away. So, you know, we're going to bring that, we'll bring the ESO lens online within in the first few years um, of, of commencing production at Maine too. And then the interesting part is, you know, and I'll talk more about this, the upside potential, that whole sumac lens um, really didn't get a lot of love over the years, uh, didn't have a lot of money spent on it, but that's over 10 million tons of inferred resources that it's right now. That's um, we think is not gonna make the feasibility study, but that's mine life, that's potential mine life. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit mm -hmm. uh, first. Uh, Vince, another question, because I see at ESO a lot of drill holes. Those are all those blue, like, vertical lines. Um, but I see more uh, indicated resources, but no measured. Is this just a matter because it was not yet calculated? Or what, what is the reason for that? Oh, uh, that was, I guess, uh, you're going to ask me a really tough technical question here. That was just through our, <laughs> through our, our resource modeling and, um, and, um, you know, we, and we have a very credible, uh, person on there, Rob Sim, um, and drill spacing. So mm -hmm. that was what we felt uh, the confidence levels were with respect to, uh, the MNI categories and what we were able to move into those categories given drill spacing and how he calculated his resource. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's just, I won't spend too much time on this other than, you know, this is what we're working with. Um, we've got an MNI category of uh, totaling, you know, close to uh, just over 23, 23 million tons. Um, and, you know, you look at the, you look at the uh, copper um, equivalent um, uh, uh, percentage of the MNI, we're looking at, you know, say one, one and a half percent copper. That's significant. I mean, you don't see too many copper deposits out there with this kind of grade. Um, and that's across the board. Um, and that's with, you know, like I said, 20, 20, almost 23 million tons. Mm -hmm. um, how many, how many pounds of copper is that? If we sorry, two point, convert it? 2.26 copper, uh, equivalent percentage, one and a half. No, that's right. Copper. No, no. How, how many pounds would that be? If we convert that's about, it that's about seven, close to, close to 800 million or 700 million pounds of copper. Okay. On an equivalent basis, that's over a billion pounds of copper now. So that's really yeah. significant. Yeah. Not bad for not bad for a, you know a little high grade VMS uh, yeah. with with. <laughs> and and again, I talked to look at the inferred category. You know, we've got an we've got an inferred category of tw almost 13 million tons still at 1.62 percent copper equivalent. So that represents a lot of upside and additional mine life. Um, you know, that's not going to make the feasibility study yet, but that's mm. that's subs the project and it's valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but these were the economics from the 2017 pre-feasibility because all this has changed now. I mean, we've, we've done, as I mentioned in my press release, we are now going to be doing 4,500 tons per day. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the content of the throughput and even being able to scale up on the throughput uh, has reverberates through operating costs, etc. It makes them more efficient. Um, and you know, all the, the, um, life of mine payable copper and all that, that's, that's all going to change. So, um, our recovery numbers have changed because we did an extensive job on the metallurgical program. So this is a, a reference to what it used to look like, but it's going to look significantly different now with mining methodology, um, with, uh, plant size and throughput, uh, coming into the feasibility study. So, um, but you can see the one thing to note here is that even back then, you know, this was a robust project, um, you know, at 265 million after tax MPV, but an IRR of 28%, um, you know, it, it's, it's a robust project. And now, you know, with increased copper prices and what we think we've done on scalability and efficiency, we're, we're, you know, aiming to continue that, that high margin, robust feel of it, but add value to it as well. Mm -hmm. That's our objective. I won't talk too much about this, but the important thing to hear is that, there's no nasties. So people will ask, well, is there arsenic? Is there all of this in the project? We've got a very, very clean concentrate. We've got something that 
rated and you know in my conversations with uh you know the traders out there a very clean and will be a very sought after concentrate so no nasties about penalty limits uh that would cause us any issues out there with respect to the concentrate how how would that be then transported because concentrate is let's say a little bit um, more material um then uh, you would do like uh, cathode copper or stuff like that so would that be then trucked or by train how how, how do you want to do that From from site, um, yes. we will we will truck it from site down to the port of Stewart, uh, and then shipped from the port of Stewart. Okay. Good. Um, just a little bit on the where we're at with permitting. So we've been working with this for years. We've done a substantial amount of work. I mean, Capstone did a substantial amount of work uh, to go through the permitting process, and they had a lot of legacy data. And we spent um, you know 2018, 19, 20, basically filling in the gaps on uh, our baseline studies. And we're in, um, and then we filed what was called a Section 11. So that's the the first gate to get through uh, the permitting process here in BC. Um, we we stopped it there because the next leg of it requires, um, you know, the money to basically make sure you go through it, and with the First Nations and the community engagement and the involvement, you want to do that. Uh, you don't want to stop once you've started. But so we got ourselves, and again, I'm talking back when capital was harder to find a couple of years ago. We got ourselves in a really good position to now really move smoothly through the permitting process, um, and we've commenced that again now. What, and, what is the time frame for that? You know, it's um, you'll see in our timelines, you know, pr pr two and a half to three years. You know, we okay. we can have we think we can have a fully permitted project uh, mm -hmm. here in Colombia. So. You know, in the scope of things, not too bad. Uh, and, you know, people might think, well, that sounds like a very long time. Well, I challenge people to find me another copper project out there um, that is, you know, A, ability level, and B, three years away from, you know, uh, a fully permitted asset in a jurisdiction like Canada and like BC. That's mm -hmm. uh, very, very safe. And just a quick note, I've talked about this earlier. The First Nations, we have two, Casca and Teltan, You know, fantastic First Nations, very pro mining, very technical, very sophisticated, very commercial, and that's evidenced by the other assets and projects that are in the region and how they've moved those forward. And, um, and so very, very good partners uh, from that perspective. And a little bit of our timeline, as I mentioned, baseline studies, that's around the permitting process that will be ongoing. Uh, feasibility study, expect uh, around the end of October, uh, we will have that done. Um, which is going to be very, very important um, to, you know, what this asset we, we're it, the first time it's going to, we think we're going to show the true value of this asset. And as everybody knows, the feasibility study is a very big de-risk point uh, of any, uh, of any project. And then you see the EA process and the permit issuance um, you know, near the end of 2023. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because the feasibility study is like in between the EA process. Is this uh, something because of the, let's say, the more special ruling in BC? Because to my understanding, normally you have to do the EA before and then maybe you finish it with the feasibility. That's that's what we've been doing. We've been working through the EA process. And again, you know, we submitted uh, we our section 11 um, and we have that filed. Um, so there's parts of it that we do before, during, and then after the feasibility study, okay. as you mentioned. And yep. then after the feasibility study and the EA process, then the permit and submission and review, that's the final pieces of getting your permit. And then you have to do the project finance. Then we do project finance, yes. Mm -hmm. So that means 2025, you could be in production? I would suggest we're thinking middle of 24-ish, 25, we'd be in production, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, good. Um, now, just I'll touch brief, briefly, and I, we talked about this. So mm -hmm. everything you know, that we talked about, the resource and what's in the M&I, but here's all the upside potential, and this is important. Um, you know, I think you're going to see next year, um, us, um, now that we're going past feasibility, and I got that under our belt, now we're going to be targeting all this exploration upside potential. Um, and just a couple of points. You know, you look at point number one in the legend and point one on the map, there's a 500-meter gap between Maine and Sumac that's never been tested. Okay. And, you know, we have reason to believe that that mineralization trends across, you know, that, that piece. Uh, all these lenses are open down dip and along strike. ESSO, which is the highest grade lens, has all grade drill intercepts 300 meters, okay, to the, uh, to the west. But those are deep holes. Those are 800 meter holes. So we, we're not going to follow those up. They're expensive to drill from surface. 
but it's there. And and so that'll be something that you mine out when you're underground. But, you know, everyone needs to remember that VMS districts, I don't know if that there's one out there. When you find stuff, it tends to grow and you tend to find more. That's generally the rule of thumb. Things just tend to kind of continue to be there and continue to get uh, uh, bigger. Um, so there's lots of opportunity. That's I call this brownfields opportunity. So these are easy drill targets. And, you know, what we've identified, and you'll see an update to this, you'll put out a press release in the next week or two, really talking more about the detail around these exploration targets, because, you know, we think there may be an opportunity now to actually expand the size of the open pit. Um, right, and that's that, that would be just my question, because if it could be, if you are successful, that between Made and Sumac, that you can enlarge the open pit, and uh, would that then require also, let's say, an updated feasibility after the feasibility? <laughs> Correct. Correct. It would, okay. but it wouldn't. We wouldn't do it so it disrupts the process and the permitting process. But yes, good. Okay. And that's low hanging fruit when you're mining. Yeah. When your pit costs are so cheap, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cutoff grades a lot lower. Um, then that's low hanging fruit. So we're definitely going to be looking at uh, all that opportunity. And then you know the blue sky, the green fields potential. This, all these brown dots. You see the orange dots where Esso Sumac and Maine is. All these brown dots, you know, we've this project has not seen any modern exploration since 1990. And these are all targets. Um, we did a bunch of work up a couple of years ago. And then again, we stopped, uh, you know, cost of capital is too expensive. But we're planning a big program next year to follow up. And I mentioned to you earlier in that slide, the geology. So those dashed lines you see are the same uh, formation or same mineralization that Esso, Sumac, and Maine have been found on, and they fold and repeat through our claim block here. So those brown dots are all viable, you know, targets, exploration targets, and we've got the sulfide horizon there. And again, this is, um, you know, this is a district play. Uh, VMS is, uh, you know, you tend to find more when you're there, and we're going to throw some money at this to see if we can uh, find more of it. But the, you know, there's there's good good potential there for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, do you want to add something? If you have any more questions, but oh, definitely, yeah. I have definitely. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation, to be honest. Uh, I really like what I saw. I think I got to buy some shares here. Um, <laughs> um, of course, this all costs money. So now to finish uh, the feasibility, yeah. Um, so what is cash in the bank and how are your finance uh, requirements? And of course, how do you see then 2022 in regard of uh, drilling and your work? Here's, I mean, you know, as a CEO of a company, we all have our wish list and our plans. And, you know, I've got enough money right now to take me through feasibility study. Yeah, I've got enough money. To, to, so I've got some comfort there. Um, I believe that, you know, this feasibility study is going to and should give me a better re-rate on the stock. Um, I mean, I've had no lack of uh, interest or phone calls in the last 12 months about, you know, from bankers to financiers to strategics. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have turned down money in the last, you know, six to eight months because, again, I'm very cautious about dilution in my cap table. I think this is worth more. Um, and I think, you know, given where Kucho's at, I think I want to show the value of this project with the feasibility study before I do any kind of significant capital raise, because I think I can do it at less dilutive prices. Um, and so that's that's my goal. I think um, we are going to have, you know, there's uh, significant um, eyes on us already from corporates, again, strategics. Um, and I don't think it's going to be hard to raise money. And I think I can do it higher when I want to. And especially on the heels of a, of a feasibility study, because that's a significant de-risking of an asset. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, um, you know, what I will look to do at some point after the feasibility study. Um, you know, I want to help things transpire. Um, and then, you know, we will look to, um, you know, for me, it's not going to be a big, big ticket to basically take us now through permitting. Um, it's not a large amount of money. And as far as next work, next uh, year's exploration program, we're going through budgets now. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's nice here in BC uh, for exploration work, uh, you know, there's it's flow through. I, and there's some very there are some very, very good flow through that those types of financings I can do at a significant premium to market again. So it's dilutive and I can put all that money into the ground for next year. So 
we're we're going through those um, those budgets and those plans uh, now over the next couple months. And again, that'll be something I'm not worried about right now. That'll be something you know uh, either at the end of the year or early next year that I can worry mm -hmm. about. Okay, um, super. Uh, last question: What is uh, the basis for copper, zinc, silver, and gold in your uh, feasibility study now? What what terms are you using, or what what price assumptions you are using? <sighs> I'm not, uh, what I will say is that you'll see the press releases for our resource modeling, we've used 350 copper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's fair. Fair. $20, uh, $20 silver, uh, $100 gold. I think it was $1.15 zinc. So, mm -hmm. and that's another thing. We, you know, we want to be very fair with, you know, so people don't say, ah, oh, you know, you, you used uh, 450 copper to get your, no, no, mm. no, no, no. <laughs> within, with the market and within reason. Um, yeah. I firmly believe, I think 350 copper is a very fair number these days. And, and mm. so, you know, I, I won't comment. I can't comment yet specifically on what metal prices we're going to use in the feasibility site. That's just a hint to, you know, what we use in our resource. And I think 350 is a fair number for the market. Okay. Um, now, you know, it'll, and I, I tell you that, you know, uh, with an asset like this, um, you know, copper price, there's a massive leverage to copper price, you know, mm -hmm. even 20 cents, 50 cents, where we're trading today at 430 copper has a massive impact uh, on the valuations of projects like this. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Um, there'll be, you know, there'll be more to come that the feasibility study will outline all those economics um, with respect to, uh, you know, how mm -hmm. this will look and it will outline what it looks like at spot prices as well. Um, so we'll, uh, there'll be lots more to talk about once we once we get this report out. Super. Perfect. Vince, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great interview presentation. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear more from you then and keep fingers crossed for your feasibility. But I have a very good feeling that this will show some very good numbers, <laughs> honestly. Well, thank you for having me, Joachim. Always a pleasure to, to speak with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was Vince Sorace, the CEO of Kutcho Copper, and you heard it very close to the feasibility study, ladies and gentlemen. And please not to forget, we talk about a fantastic copper, zinc, but also with silver and gold byproducts project here. But uh, what is really important for me is uh, that this is situated in British Columbia in Canada. So super safe jurisdiction. And uh, as we all know, this world needs a lot more copper. So I could imagine Imagine that this project with the right numbers be published in some weeks and months here um, with the feasibility, I could imagine this will attract a lot of attention and of course a lot of yeah, mid-sized to big boys. So I would suggest you make up your mind and your due diligence on Kutcher Copper. I think it's a great company after uh, talking half an hour here with Vince. And uh, yeah, we will keep you posted and thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Switzerland.